Section four of Madame Chrysanthème by Pierre Lotti. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book two, chapter twenty four. Sociability. August fourth. Our ship, the Triomphante, which has been lying in the harbour almost at the foot of the hill on which stands my house, enters the dock to-day to undergo repairs rendered necessary by the long blockade of Formosa i am now a long way from my home and am compelled to cross by boat the whole breadth of the bay when i wish to see chrysanthem for the dock is situated on the shore opposite to Diu Genji. it is sunk in a little valley narrow and deep midst all kinds of foliage bamboos camellias trees of all sorts our masts and spars seen from the deck look as if they were tangled among the branches the situation of the vessel no longer afloat gives the crew a greater facility for clandestine escapes from the ship at no matter what hour of the night and our sailors have made friends with all the girls of the villages perched on the mountains above us these quarters and this excessive liberty give me some uneasiness about my poor eve for this country of frivolous pleasure has a little turned his head moreover i am more and more convinced that he is in love with chrysanthem it is really a pity that the sentiment has not occurred to me instead since it is i who have gone the length of marrying her chapter twenty five unwelcome guests despite the increased distance i continue my regular visits to Diu Genji. when night has fallen and the four couples who compose our society have joined us as well as eve and the amazingly tall friend we descend again into the town stumbling by lantern light down the steep stairways and slopes of the old suburb this nocturnal ramble is always the same and is accompanied always by the same amusements we pause before the same queer booths we drink the same sugared drinks served to us in the same little gardens but our troop is often more numerous to begin with we chaperone uyuki who is confided to our care by her parents then we have two cousins of my wife's pretty little creatures and lastly friends guests of sometimes only ten or twelve years old little girls of the neighbourhood to whom our musmes wish to show some politeness thus a singular company of tiny beings forms our suite and follows us into the tea gardens in the evenings the most absurd faces with sprigs of flowers stuck in the oddest fashion in their comical and childish heads one might suppose it was a whole school of musmes out for an evening's frolic under our care eve returns with us when the time comes to remount our hill chrysanthème heaves great sighs like a tired child and stops on every step leaning on our arms when we have reached our destination he says good night just touches chrysanthème's hand and descending once more by the slope which leads to the quays and the shipping he crosses the roadstead in a sampan to get on board the triomphante meantime we with the aid of a sort of secret key open the door of our garden where madame brune's pots of flowers ranged in the darkness send forth delicious odours in the night air we cross the garden by moonlight or starlight and mount to our own rooms if it is very late a frequent occurrence we find all our wooden panels drawn and tightly shut by the careful monsieur Sucre, as a precaution against thieves and our apartment is as close and as private as if it were a real european house in this dwelling when every chink is thus closed a strange odour mingles with the musk and the lotus an odour essential to japan to the yellow race belonging to the soil or emanating from the venerable woodwork almost an odour of wild beasts the mosquito curtain of dark blue gauze ready hung for the night falls from the ceiling with the air of a mysterious vellum the gilded buddha smiles eternally at the night lamps burning before him some great moth a constant frequenter of the house which during the day sleeps clinging to our ceiling flutters at this hour under the very nose of the god turning and flitting round the thin quivering flames and motionless on the wall its feelers spread out star-like sleeps some great garden spider which one must not kill because it is night who says chrysanthem indignantly pointing it out to me with levelled finger quick where is the fan kept for the purpose wherewith to hunt it out of doors 
around us reigns a silence which is almost oppressive after all the joyous noises of the town and all the laughter now hushed of our band of musmes a silence of the country of some sleeping village chapter twenty six a quiet smoke the sound of the innumerable wooden panels which at nightfall are pulled and shut in every japanese house is one of the peculiarities of the country which will remain longest imprinted on my memory from our neighbours houses these noises reach us one after the other floating to us over the green gardens more or less deadened more or less distant just below us madame prune's panels move very badly creak and make a hideous noise in their worn-out grooves ours are somewhat noisy too for the old house is full of echoes and there are at least twenty screens to run over long slides in order to close in completely the kind of open hall in which we live usually it is chrysanthem who undertakes this piece of household work and a great deal of trouble it gives her for she often pinches her fingers in the singular awkwardness of her two tiny hands which never have been accustomed to do any work then comes her toilette for the night with a certain grace she lets fall the day dress and slips on a more simple one of blue cotton which has the same pagoda sleeves the same shape all but the train and which she fastens round her waist with a sash of muslin of the same colour the high head-dress remains untouched it is needless to say that is all but the pins which are taken out and laid beside her in a lacquer box then there is the little silver pipe that must absolutely be smoked before going to sleep this is one of the customs which most provoke me but it has to be borne chrysanthem squats like a gypsy before a certain square box made of red wood which contains a little tobacco jar a little porcelain stove full of hot embers and finally a little bamboo pot serving at the same time as ashtray and cuspidor madame prune's smoking-box downstairs and every smoking-box in japan is exactly the same and contains precisely the same objects arranged in precisely the same manner and wherever it may be whether in the house of the rich or the poor it always lies about somewhere on the floor the word pipe is at once too trivial and too big to be applied to this delicate silver tube which is perfectly straight and at the end of which in a microscopic receptacle is placed one pinch of golden tobacco chopped finer than silken thread two puffs or at most three it lasts scarcely a few seconds and the pipe is finished then tap 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 the little tube is struck smartly against the edge of the smoking box to knock out the ashes which never will fall and this tapping heard everywhere in every house at every hour of the day or night quick and droll as the scratchings of a monkey is in japan one of the noises most characteristic of human life anata nominase you must smoke too says chrysanthem having again filled the tiresome little pipe she puts the silver tube to my lips with a bow courtesy forbids my refusal but i find it detestably bitter before laying myself down under the blue mosquito net i open two of the panels in the room one on the side of the silent and deserted footpath the other on the garden side overlooking the terraces so that the night air may breathe upon us even at the risk of bringing the company of some belated cockchafer or more giddy moth our wooden house with its thin old walls vibrates at night like a great dry violin and the slightest noises have a startling resonance beneath the veranda are hung two little aeolian harps which at the least ruffle of the breeze running through their blades of grass emit a gentle tinkling sound like the harmonious murmur of a brook outside to the very farthest limits of the distance the cicalas continue their sonorous and never-ending concert over our heads on the black roof is heard passing like a witch's sabbath the raging battle to the death of cats rats and owls presently when in the early dawn a fresher breeze mounting upward from the sea and the deep harbour reaches us chrysanthem rises and slyly shuts the panels i have opened before that however she will have risen at least three times to smoke having yawned like a cat stretched herself twisted in every direction her little amber arms and her graceful little hands she sits up resolutely with all the waking sighs and broken syllables of a child pretty and fascinating enough 
then she emerges from the gauze net fills her little pipe and breathes a few puffs of the bitter and unpleasant mixture then comes the tap 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 against the box to shake out the ashes in the silence of the night it makes quite a terrible noise which wakes madame prune this is fatal madame prune is at once seized also with a longing to smoke which may not be denied then to the noise from above comes an answering tap 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 from below exactly like it exasperating and inevitable as an echo chapter twenty seven the prayerful madame prune more cheerful are the sounds of morning the cocks crowing the wooden panels all around the neighbourhood sliding back upon their rollers or the strange cry of some fruit seller patrolling our lofty suburb in the early dawn and the grasshoppers actually seem to chirp more loudly to celebrate the return of the sunlight above all rises to our ears from below the sound of madame prune's long prayers ascending through the floor monotonous as the song of a somnambulist regular and soothing as the plash of a fountain it lasts three-quarters of an hour at least it drones along a rapid flow of words in a high nasal key from time to time when the inattentive spirits are not listening it is accompanied by a clapping of dry palms or by harsh sounds from a kind of wooden clapper made of two discs of mandragora root it is an uninterrupted stream of prayer its flow never ceases and the quavering continues without stopping like the bleating of a delirious old goat after washing the hands and feet say the sacred books the great god amaterase omi kami who is the royal power of japan must be invoked the manes of all the defunct emperors descended from him must also be invoked next the manes of all his personal ancestors to the farthest generation the spirits of the air and the sea the spirits of all secret and impure places the spirits of the tombs of the district whence you spring etc etc i worship and implore you sings madame prune o amaterase omikami royal power cease not to protect your faithful people who are ready to sacrifice themselves for their country grant that i may become as holy as yourself and drive from my mind all dark thoughts i am a coward and a sinner purge me from my cowardice and sinfulness even as the north wind drives the dust into the sea wash me clean from all my iniquities as one washes away uncleanness in the river of carmel make me the richest woman in the world i believe in your glory which shall be spread over the whole earth and illuminate it for ever for my happiness grant me the continued good health of my family and above all my own who o amaterase o mikami do worship and adore you and only you etc etc here follow all the emperors all the spirits and the interminable list of ancestors in her trembling old woman's falsetto madame prune sings all this without omitting anything at a pace which almost takes away her breath and very strange it is to hear at length it seems hardly a human voice it sounds like a series of magic formulas unwinding themselves from an inexhaustible roller and escaping to take flight through the air by its very weirdness and by the persistency of its incantation it ends by producing in my half-awakened brain an almost religious impression every day i wake to the sound of this shintoist litany chanted beneath me vibrating through the exquisite clearness of the summer mornings while our night lamps burn low before the smiling buddha while the eternal sun hardly risen already sends through the cracks of our wooden panels its bright rays which dart like golden arrows through our darkened dwelling and our blue gauze tent this is the moment at which i must rise descend hurriedly to the sea by grassy footpaths all wet with dew and so regain my ship alas in the days gone by it was the cry of the muezzin which used to awaken me in the dark winter mornings in far away night shrouded stambul chapter twenty eight a doll's correspondence chrysanthem has brought but few things with her knowing that our domestic life would probably be brief she has placed her gowns and her fine sashes in little closed recesses hidden in one of the walls of our apartment the north wall the only one of the four which cannot be taken to pieces 
the doors of these niches are white paper panels the standing shelves and inside partitions consisting of light woodwork are put together almost too finically and too ingeniously giving rise to suspicions of secret drawers and conjuring tricks we put there only things without any value having a vague feeling that the cupboards themselves might spirit them away the box in which chrysanthème stores away her gewgaws and letters is one of the things that amuse me most it is of english make tin and bears on its cover the coloured representation of some manufactory in the neighbourhood of london of course it is as an exotic work of art as a precious knick-knack that chrysanthème prefers it to any of her other boxes in lacquer or inlaid work it contains all that a mousme requires for her correspondence indian ink a paintbrush very thin grey tinted paper cut up in long narrow strips and odd-shaped envelopes into which these strips are slipped having been folded up in about thirty folds the envelopes are ornamented with pictures of landscapes fishes crabs or birds on some old letters addressed to her i can make out the two characters that represent her name kikusan chrysanthème madame and when i question her she replies in japanese with an air of importance my dear they are letters from my woman friends oh those friends of chrysanthème what funny little faces they have that same box contains their portraits their photographs stuck on visiting cards which are printed on the back with the name of uyeno the fashionable photographer in nagasaki the little creatures fit only to figure daintily on painted fans who have striven to assume a dignified attitude when once their necks have been placed in the headrest and they have been told now don't move it would really amuse me to read the letters of my musme's friends and above all her replies chapter twenty nine sudden showers august tenth it rained this evening heavily and the night was close and dark about ten o'clock on our return from one of the fashionable tea-houses we frequent we arrived eve chrysanthème and i at the familiar angle of the principal street the turn where we must take leave of the lights and noises of the town to climb up the dark steps and steep paths that lead to our dwelling at Diu Genji. but before beginning our ascent we must first buy lanterns from an old tradeswoman called madame très propre whose regular customers we are it is amazing what a quantity of these paper lanterns we consume they are invariably decorated in the same way with painted night moths or bats fastened to the ceiling at the farther end of the shop they hang in enormous clusters and the old woman seeing us arrive gets upon a table to take them down grey or red are our usual choice madame très propre knows our preferences and leaves the green or blue lanterns aside but it is always hard work to unhook one on account of the little short sticks by which they are held and the strings with which they are tied getting entangled together in an exaggerated pantomime madame très propre expresses her despair at wasting so much of our valuable time oh if it only depended on her personal efforts but ah the natural perversity of inanimate things which have no consideration for human dignity with monkeyish antics she even deems it her duty to threaten the lanterns and shake her fist at these inextricably tangled strings which have the presumption to delay us it is all very well but we know this manoeuvre by heart and if the old lady loses patience so do we chrysanthème who is half asleep is seized with a fit of kitten-like yawning which she does not even trouble to hide behind her hand and which appears to be endless she pulls a very long face at the thought of the steep hill we must struggle up to-night through the pelting rain i have the same feeling and am thoroughly annoyed to what purpose do i clamber up every evening to that suburb when it offers me no attractions whatever the rain increases what are we to do outside gins pass rapidly calling out take care splashing the foot passengers and casting through the shower streams of light from their many-coloured lanterns musmes and elderly ladies pass tucked up muddy laughing nevertheless under their paper umbrellas exchanging greetings clacking their wooden patterns on the stone pavement the whole street is filled with the noise of the pattering feet and pattering rain as good luck will have it at the same moment passes number four hundred and fifteen our poor relative who seeing our distress stops and promises to help us out of our difficulty 
as soon as he has deposited on the quay an englishman he is conveying he will come to our aid and bring all that is necessary to relieve us from our lamentable situation at last our lantern is unhooked lighted and paid for there is another shop opposite where we stop every evening it is that of madame leur the woman who sells waffles we always buy a provision from her to refresh us on the way a very lively young woman is this pastry cook and most eager to make herself agreeable she looks quite like a screen picture behind her piled up cakes ornamented with little posies we will take shelter under her roof while we wait and to avoid the drops that fall heavily from the water spouts wedge ourselves tightly against her display of white and pink sweetmeats so artistically spread out on fresh and delicate branches of cypress poor number four hundred and fifteen what a providence he is to us already he reappears most excellent cousin ever smiling ever running while the water streams down his handsome bare legs he brings us two umbrellas borrowed from a china merchant who is also a distant relative of ours like me eve has till now never consented to use such a thing but he now accepts one because it is droll of paper of course with innumerable folds waxed and gummed and the inevitable flight of stalks forming a wreath around it chrysanthème yawning more and more in her kitten-like fashion becomes coaxing in order to be helped along and tries to take my arm i beg you mousme this evening to take the arm of eve's son i am sure that will suit us all three and there they go she tiny figure hanging on to the big fellow and so they climb up i lead the way carrying the lantern that lights our steps whose flame i protect as well as i can under my fantastic umbrella on each side of the road is heard the roaring torrent of stormy waters rolling down from the mountain side tonight the way seems long difficult and slippery a succession of interminable flights of steps gardens and houses piled up one above another waste lands and trees which in the darkness shake their dripping foliage on our heads one would say that nagasaki is ascending at the same time as ourselves but yonder and very far away is a vapory mist which seems luminous against the blackness of the sky and from the town rises a confused murmur of voices and laughter and a rumbling of gongs the summer rain has not yet refreshed the atmosphere on account of the stormy heat the little suburban houses have been left open like sheds and we can see all that is going on lamps burn perpetually before the altars dedicated to buddha and to the souls of the ancestors but all good nipponese have already laid down to rest under the traditional tents of bluish green gauze we can see whole families stretched out in rows they are either sleeping or hunting the mosquitoes or fanning themselves nipponese men and women nipponese babies too lying side by side with their parents each one young or old in his little dark blue cotton nightdress and with his little wooden block on which to rest the nape of his neck a few houses are open where amusements are still going on here and there from the sombre gardens the sound of a guitar reaches our ears playing some dance which gives in its weird rhythm a strange impression of sadness here is the well surrounded by bamboos where we are wont to make a nocturnal halt for chrysanthem to take breath eve begs me to throw forward the red gleam of my lantern in order to recognize the place for it marks our halfway resting place and at last at last here is our house the door is closed all is silent and dark our panels have been carefully shut by monsieur sucre and madame prune the rain streams down the wood of our old black walls in such weather it is impossible to allow eve to return downhill and wander along the shore in quest of a sampan no he shall not return on board to-night we will put him up in our house his little room has indeed been already provided for in the conditions of our lease and notwithstanding his discreet refusal we immediately set work to make it let us go in take off our boots shake ourselves like so many cats that have been out in a shower and step up to our apartment in front of buddha the little lamps are burning in the middle of the room the night blue gauze is stretched on entering the first impression is favourable our dwelling is pretty this evening the late hour and deep silence give it an air of mystery 
and then in such weather it is always pleasant to get home come let us at once prepare eve's room chrysantheme quite elated at the prospect of having her big friend near her sets to work with a good will moreover the task is easy we have only to slip three or four paper panels in their grooves to make at once a separate room or compartment in the great box we live in i had thought that these panels were entirely white but no on each is a group of two stalks painted in grey tints in those inevitable attitudes consecrated by japanese art one bearing aloft its proud head and haughtily raising its leg the other scratching itself oh these stalks how tired one gets of them at the end of a month spent in japan eve is now in bed and sleeping under our roof sleep has come to him sooner than to me to-night for somehow i fancy i had seen long glances exchanged between him and chrysantheme i have left this little creature in his hands like a toy and i begin to fear lest i should have caused some perturbation in his mind i do not trouble my head about this little japanese girl but eve it would be decidedly wrong on his part and would greatly diminish my faith in him we hear the rain falling on our old roof the cicalas are mute odors of wet earth reach us from the gardens and the mountain i feel terribly dreary in this room to-night the noise of the little pipe irritates me more than usual and as chrysantheme crouches in front of her smoking-box i suddenly discover in her an air of low breeding in the very worst sense of the word i should hate her my mousme if she were to entice eve into committing a fault a fault which i should perhaps never be able to forgive chapter thirty a little domestic difficulty august twelfth the y and siku san couple were divorced yesterday the charles n and Compagnol household is getting on very badly they have had some trouble with those prying grinding insupportable little men dressed up in grey suits who are called police agents and who by threatening their landlord have had them turned out of their house under the obsequious amiability of this people lurks a secret hatred toward europeans they are therefore obliged to accept their mother-in-law's hospitality a very disagreeable situation and then charles n fancies his mousme is faithless it is hardly possible however for us to deceive ourselves these would-be maidens to whom monsieur kangourou has introduced us have already had in their lives one adventure at least and perhaps more it is therefore only natural that we should have our suspicions the z and tuki san couple jog on quarrelling all the time my household maintains a more dignified air though it is none the less dreary i had indeed thought of a divorce but have really no good reason for offering chrysantheme such a gratuitous affront moreover there is another more imperative reason why i should remain quiet i too have had difficulties with the civilian authorities the day before yesterday m sucre quite upset madame prune almost swooning and mademoiselle oyuki bathed in tears stormed my rooms the nipponese police agents had called and threatened them with the law for letting rooms outside of the european concession to a frenchman morganatically married to a japanese and the terror of being prosecuted brought them to me with a thousand apologies but with the humble request that i should leave the next day i therefore went off accompanied by the wonderfully tall friend who expresses himself in japanese better than i to the registry office with the full intention of making a terrible row in the language of this exquisitely polite people terms of abuse are totally wanting when very angry one is obliged to be satisfied with using the thou a mark of inferiority and the familiar conjugation habitually used towards those of low birth sitting upon the table used for weddings among the flurried little policemen i opened the conversation in the following terms in order that thou shouldst leave me in peace in the suburb i am inhabiting what bribe must i offer thee o little beings more contemptible than any mere street porter great and general dismay silent consternation and low bows greet my words they at last reply that my honourable person shall not be molested indeed they ask for nothing better only in order to subscribe to the laws of the country i ought to have come here and given my name and that of the young person that with whom 
oh that is going too far i came here for that purpose contemptible creatures not three weeks ago then taking up myself the civil register and turning over the pages rapidly i found my signature and beside it the little hieroglyphics drawn by chrysanthème there idiots look at that arrival of a very high functionary a ridiculous little old fellow in a black coat who from his office had been listening to the row what is the matter what is it what is this annoyance put upon the french officers i state my case politely to this personage who cannot make apologies and promises enough the little agents prostrate themselves on all fours sink into the earth and we leave them cold and dignified without returning their bows monsieur sucre and madame prune may now make their minds easy they will not be disturbed again chapter thirty one butterflies and beetles august twenty third the prolonged sojourn of the triomphant in the dock and the distance of our dwelling from the town have been my excuse these last two or three days for not going up to du Genji to see chrysanthème it is dreary work in these docks at early dawn a legion of little japanese workmen invade us bringing their dinners in baskets and gourds like the working men in our arsenals but with a poor shabby appearance and a ferreting hurried manner which reminds one of rats silently they slip under the keel at the bottom of the hold in all the holes sawing nailing repairing the heat is intense in this spot overshadowed by the rocks and tangled masses of foliage at two o'clock in the broad sunlight we have a new and far prettier invasion that of the beetles and butterflies there are butterflies as wonderful as those on the fans some all black giddily dash up against us so light and airy that they seem merely a pair of quivering wings fastened together without any body yves astonished gazes at them saying in his boyish manner oh i saw such a big one just now such a big one it quite frightened me i thought it was a bat attacking me a steersman who has captured a very curious specimen carries it off carefully to press between the leaves of his signal book like a flower another sailor passing by taking his small roast to the oven in a mess bowl looks at him quizzically and says you had much better give it to me i'd cook it chapter thirty two strange yearnings august twenty fourth nearly five days have passed since i abandoned my little house in chrysanthème since yesterday we have had a tremendous storm of rain and wind a typhoon that has passed or is passing over us we beat to quarters in the middle of the night to lower the topmasts strike the lower yards and take every precaution against bad weather the butterflies no longer hover around us everything tosses and writhes overhead on the steep slopes of the mountain the trees shiver the long grasses bend low as if in pain terrible gusts rack them with a hissing sound branches bamboo leaves and earth fall like rain upon us in this land of pretty little trifles this violent tempest is out of harmony it seems as if its efforts were exaggerated and its music too loud toward evening the dark clouds roll by so rapidly that the showers are of short duration and soon pass over then i attempt a walk on the mountain above us in the wet verdure little pathways lead up it between thickets of camellias and bamboo waiting till a shower is over i take refuge in the courtyard of an old temple halfway up the hill buried in a wood of century plants with gigantic branches it is reached by granite steps through strange gateways as deeply furrowed as the old celtic dolmens the trees have also invaded this yard the daylight is overcast with a greenish tint and the drenching torrent of rain is full of torn-up leaves and moss old granite monsters of unknown shapes are seated in the corners and grimace with smiling ferocity their faces are full of indefinable mystery that makes me shudder amid the moaning music of the wind in the gloomy shadows of the clouds and branches they could not have resembled the japanese of our day the men who had thus conceived these ancient temples who built them everywhere and filled the country with them even in its most solitary nooks an hour later in the twilight of that stormy day on the same mountain i encountered a clump of trees somewhat similar to oaks in appearance 
they too have been twisted by the tempest and the tufts of undulating grass at their feet are laid low tossed about in every direction there was suddenly brought back to my mind my first impression of a strong wind in the woods of limoise in the province of saint ange twenty-eight years ago in a month of march of my childhood that the first windstorm my eyes ever beheld sweeping over the landscape blew in just the opposite quarter of the world and many years have rapidly passed over that memory the spot where the best part of my life has been spent i refer too often i fancy to my childhood i am foolishly fond of it but it seems to me that then only did i truly experience sensations or impressions the smallest trifles i saw or heard then were full of deep and hidden meaning recalling past images out of oblivion and reawakening memories of prior existences or else they were presentiments of existences to come future incarnations in the land of dreams expectations of wondrous marvels that life and the world held in store for me for a later period no doubt when i should be grown up well i have grown up and have found nothing that answered to my indefinable expectations on the contrary all has narrowed and darkened around me my vague recollections of the past have become blurred the horizons before me have slowly closed in and become full of grey darkness soon will my time come to return to eternal rest and i shall leave this world without ever having understood the mysterious cause of these mirages of my childhood i shall bear away with me a lingering regret for i know not what lost home that i have failed to find of the unknown beings ardently longed for whom alas i never have embraced chapter thirty three a generous husband displaying many affectations m sucre dips the tip of his delicate paint-brush in india ink and traces a pair of charming stalks on a pretty sheet of rice paper offering them to me in the most courteous manner as a souvenir of himself i have put them in my cabin on board and when i look at them i fancy i can see m sucre tracing them with an airy touch and with elegant facility the saucer in which he mixes his ink is in itself a little gem it is chiselled out of a piece of jade and represents a tiny lake with a carved border imitating rockwork on this border is a little mamma toad also in jade advancing as if to bathe in the little lake in which m sucre carefully keeps a few drops of very dark liquid the mamma toad has four little baby toads in jade one perched on her head the other three playing about under her m sucre has painted many a stalk in the course of his lifetime and he really excels in reproducing groups and duets if one may so express it of this bird few japanese possess the art of interpreting this subject in a manner at once so rapid and so tasteful first he draws the two beaks then the four claws then the backs the feathers dash 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 with a dozen strokes of his clever brush held in his daintily posed hand it is done and always perfectly well done m kangourou relates without seeing anything wrong in it whatever that formerly this talent was of great service to m sucre it appears that madame prune how shall i say such a thing and who could guess it now on beholding so devout and sedate an old lady with eyebrows so scrupulously shaven however it appears that madame prune used to receive a great many visits from gentlemen gentlemen who always came alone which led to some gossip therefore when madame prune was engaged with one visitor if a new arrival made his appearance the ingenious husband to induce him to wait patiently and to while away the time in the anteroom immediately offered to paint him some storks in a variety of attitudes and this is why in nagasaki all the japanese gentlemen of a certain age have in their collections two or three of these little pictures for which they are indebted to the delicate and original talent of m sucre End of section four. Section five of Madame Chrysanthème by Pierre Lotti. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book three, chapter thirty four. The Feast of the Temple. Sunday, August twenty fifth about six o'clock while i was on duty the triomphante abandoned her prison walls between the mountains and came out of dock 
after much manoeuvring we took up our old moorings in the harbour at the foot of the Jujenji hills the weather was again calm and cloudless the sky presenting a peculiar clarity as if it had been swept by a cyclone an exceeding transparency bringing out the minutest details in the distance till then unseen as if the terrible blast had blown away every vestige of the floating mists and left behind it nothing but void and boundless space the colouring of woods and mountains stood out again in the resplendent verdancy of spring after the torrents of rain like the wet colours of some freshly washed painting the sampans and junks which for the last three days had been lying under shelter had now put out to sea and the bay was covered with their white sails which looked like a flight of enormous seabirds at eight o'clock at nightfall our manoeuvres having ended i embarked with eve on board a sampan this time it is he who is carrying me off and taking me back to my home on land a delicious perfume of new-mown hay greets us and the road across the mountains is bathed in glorious moonlight we go straight up to dujenji to join chrysanthem i feel almost remorseful although i hardly show it for my neglect of her looking up i recognize from afar my little house perched on high it is wide open and lighted i even hear the sound of a guitar then i perceive the gilt head of my buddha between the little bright flames of its two hanging night lamps now chrysanthem appears on the veranda looking out as if she expected us and with her wonderful bows of hair and long falling sleeves her silhouette is thoroughly nipponese as i enter she comes forward to kiss me in a graceful though rather hesitating manner while oyuki more demonstrative throws her arms around me not without a certain pleasure do i see once more this japanese home which i wonder to find still mine when i had almost forgotten its existence chrysanthem has put fresh flowers in our vases spread out her hair donned her best clothes and lighted our lamps to honour my return from the balcony she had watched the triomphante reach the dock and in the expectation of our prompt return she had made her preparations then to while away the time she was studying a duet on the guitar with oyuki not a question did she ask nor a reproach did she make quite the contrary we understood she said how impossible it was in such dreadful weather to undertake so lengthy a crossing in a sampan she smiled like a pleased child and i should be fastidious indeed if i did not admit that to-night she is charming i announce my intention of taking a long stroll through nagasaki we will take oyuki san and two little cousins who happen to be here as well as some other neighbours if they wish it we will buy the most amusing toys eat all sorts of cakes and entertain ourselves to our heart's content how lucky we are to be here just at the right moment they exclaim jumping with joy how fortunate we are this very evening there is to be a pilgrimage to the great temple of the jumping tortoise the whole town will be there all our married friends have already started the whole set x y z tuki san campanule and jeanqui with the friend of amazing height and these two poor chrysanthem and poor oyuki would have been obliged to stay at home with heavy hearts had we not arrived because madame prune had been seized with faintness and hysterics after her dinner quickly the mousmes must deck themselves out chrysanthem is ready oyuki hurries changes her dress and putting on a mouse-coloured grey robe begs me to arrange the bows of her fine sash black satin lined with yellow sticking at the same time in her hair a silver top-knot we light our lanterns swinging at the end of little sticks m sucre overwhelming us with thanks for his daughter accompanies us on all fours to the door and we go off gaily through the clear and balmy night below we find the town in all the animation of a great holiday the streets are thronged the crowd passes by a laughing capricious slow unequal tide flowing onward however steadily in the same direction toward the same goal from it rises a penetrating but light murmur in which dominate the sounds of laughter and the low-toned interchange of polite speeches then follow lanterns upon lanterns never in my life have i seen so many so variegated so complicated and so extraordinary we follow drifting with the surging crowd borne along by it there are groups of women of every age decked out in their smartest clothes crowds of mousmes with aigrettes of flowers in their hair 
or little silver topknots like oyuki pretty little physiognomies little narrow eyes peeping between their slits like those of newborn kittens fat pale little cheeks round puffed out half-opened lips they are pretty nevertheless these little nipponese in their smiles and childishness the men on the other hand wear many a pot hat pompously added to the long national robe and giving thereby a finishing touch to their cheerful ugliness resembling nothing so much as dancing monkeys they carry boughs in their hands whole shrubs even amid the foliage of which dangle all sorts of curious lanterns in the shapes of imps and birds as we advance in the direction of the temple the streets become more noisy and crowded all along the houses are endless stalls raised on trestles displaying sweetmeats of every colour toys branches of flowers nosegays and masks there are masks everywhere boxes full of them carts full of them the most popular being the one that represents the livid and cunning muzzle contracted as by a death-like grimace the long straight ears and sharp pointed teeth of the white fox sacred to the god of rice there are also others symbolic of gods or monsters livid grimacing convulsed with wigs and beards of natural hair all manner of folk even children purchase these horrors and fasten them over their faces every sort of instrument is for sale among them many of those crystal trumpets which sound so strangely this evening they are enormous six feet long at least and the noise they make is unlike anything ever heard before one would say gigantic turkeys were gobbling amid the crowd striving to inspire fear in the religious amusements of this people it is not possible for us to penetrate the mysteriously hidden meaning of things we cannot divine the boundary at which jesting stops and mystic fear steps in these customs these symbols these masks all that tradition and atavism have jumbled together in the japanese brain proceed from sources utterly dark and unknown to us even the oldest records fail to explain them to us in anything but a superficial and cursory manner simply because we have absolutely nothing in common with this people we pass through the midst of their mirth and their laughter without understanding the wherefore so totally do they differ from our own chrysanthem with eve oyuki with me fraise and zinnia our cousins walking before us under our watchful eyes move slowly through the crowd holding hands lest we should lose one another along the streets leading to the temple the wealthy inhabitants have decorated the fronts of their houses with vases and nosegays the peculiar shed-like buildings common in this country with their open platform frontage are particularly well suited for the display of choice objects all the houses have been thrown open and the interiors are hung with draperies that hide the back of the apartments in front of these hangings and standing slightly back from the movement of the passing crowd the various exhibited articles are placed methodically in a row under the full glare of hanging lamps hardly any flowers compose the nosegays nothing but foliage some rare and priceless others chosen as if purposely from the commonest plants arranged however with such taste as to make them appear new and choice ordinary lettuce leaves tall cabbage stalks are placed with exquisite artificial taste in vessels of marvellous workmanship all the vases are of bronze but the designs are varied according to each changing fancy some complicated and twisted others and by far the larger number graceful and simple but of a simplicity so studied and exquisite that to our eyes they seem the revelation of an unknown art the subversion of all acquired notions of form on turning a corner of a street by good luck we meet our married comrades of the triomphante and jeanqui toukisan and Campanule. bows and curtsies are exchanged by the mousmes reciprocal manifestations of joy at meeting then forming a compact band we are carried off by the ever-increasing crowd and continue our progress in the direction of the temple the streets gradually ascend the temples are always built on a height and by degrees as we mount there is added to the brilliant fairyland of lanterns and costumes yet another ethereally blue in the haze of distance all nagasaki its pagodas its mountains its still waters full of the rays of moonlight seem to rise with us into the air slowly step by step one may say it springs up around enveloping in one great shimmering veil all the foreground with its dazzling red lights and many-coloured streamers 
no doubt we are drawing near for here are steps porticoes and monsters hewn out of enormous blocks of granite we now have to climb a series of steps almost carried by the surging crowd ascending with us we have arrived at the temple courtyard this is the last and most astonishing scene in the evening's fairy tale a luminous and weird scene with fantastic distances lighted up by the moon with the gigantic trees the sacred cryptomerias elevating their sombre boughs into a vast dome here we are all seated with our musmes beneath the light awning wreathed in flowers of one of the many little tea-houses improvised in this courtyard we are on a terrace at the top of the great steps up which the crowd continues to flock and at the foot of a portico which stands erect with the rigid massiveness of a colossus against the dark night sky at the foot also of a monster who stares down upon us with his big stony eyes his cruel grimace and smile this portico and the monster are the two great overwhelming masses in the foreground of the incredible scene before us they stand out with dazzling boldness against the vague and ashy blue of the distant sphere beyond behind them nagasaki is spread out in a bird's-eye view faintly outlined in the transparent darkness with myriads of little coloured lights and the extravagantly dented profile of the mountains is delineated on the starlit sky blue upon blue transparency upon transparency a corner of the harbour also is visible far up undefined like a lake lost in clouds the water faintly illumined by a ray of moonlight making it shine like a sheet of silver around us the long crystal trumpets keep up their gobble groups of polite and frivolous persons pass and repass like fantastic shadows childish bands of small-eyed musmes with smiles so candidly meaningless and coiffures shining through their bright silver flowers ugly men waving at the end of long branches their eternal lanterns shaped like birds gods or insects behind us in the illuminated and wide-open temple the bonzes sit immovable embodiments of doctrine in the glittering sanctuary inhabited by divinities chimeras and symbols the crowd monotonously droning its mingled prayers and laughter presses round them sowing its arms broadcast with a continuous jingle the money rolls on the ground into the precincts reserved to the priests where the white mats entirely disappear under the mass of many-sized coins accumulated there as if after a deluge of silver and bronze we however feel thoroughly at sea in the midst of this festivity we look on we laugh like the rest we make foolish and senseless remarks in a language insufficiently learned which this evening i know not why we can hardly understand notwithstanding the night breeze we find it very hot under our awning and we absorb quantities of odd-looking water ices served in cups which taste like scented frost or rather like flowers steeped in snow our musmes order for themselves great bowls of candied beans mixed with hail real hailstones such as we might pick up after a hailstorm in march glue 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 the crystal trumpets slowly repeat their notes the powerful sonority of which has a laboured and smothered sound as if they came from under water they mingle with the jingling of rattles and the noise of castanets we have also the impression of being carried away in the irresistible swing of this incomprehensible gaiety composed in proportions we can hardly measure of elements mystic puerile and even ghastly a sort of religious terror is diffused by the hidden idols divined in the temple behind us by the mumbled prayers confusedly heard above all by the horrible heads in lacquered wood representing foxes which as they pass hide human faces hideous livid masks in the gardens and outbuildings of the temple the most inconceivable mountebanks have taken up their quarters their black streamers painted with white letters looking like funeral trappings as they float in the wind from the tops of their tall flagstaffs thither we turn our steps as soon as our musmes have ended their orisons and bestowed their arms in one of the booths a man stretched on a table flat on his back is alone on the stage puppets of almost human size with horribly grinning masks spring out of his body they speak gesticulate then fall back like empty rags with a sudden spring they start up again change their costumes change their faces tearing about in one continual frenzy suddenly three even four appear at the same time 
they are nothing more than the four limbs of the outstretched man whose legs and arms raised on high are each dressed up and capped with a wig under which peers a mask between these phantoms tremendous fighting and battling take place and many a sword thrust is exchanged the most fearful of all is a certain puppet representing an old hag every time she appears with her weird head and ghastly grin the lights burn low the music of the accompanying orchestra moans forth a sinister strain given by the flutes mingled with a rattling tremolo which sounds like the clatter of bones this creature evidently plays an ugly part in the piece that of a horrible old ghoul spiteful and famished still more appalling than her person is her shadow which projected upon a white screen is abnormally and vividly distinct by means of some unknown process this shadow which nevertheless follows all her movements assumes the aspect of a wolf at a given moment the hag turns round and presents the profile of her distorted snub nose as she accepts the bowl of rice which is offered to her on the screen at the very same instant appears the elongated outline of the wolf with its pointed ears its muzzle and chops its great teeth and hanging tongue the orchestra grinds wails quivers then suddenly bursts out into funereal shrieks like a concert of owls the hag is now eating and her wolfish shadow is eating also greedily moving its jaws and nibbling at another shadow easy to recognize the arm of a little child we now go on to see the great salamander of japan an animal rare in this country and quite unknown elsewhere a great cold mass sluggish and benumbed looking like some antediluvian experiment forgotten in the inner seas of this archipelago next comes the trained elephant the terror of our musmes the equilibrists the menagerie it is one o'clock in the morning before we are back at Dujenji we first get eve to bed in the little paper room he has already once occupied then we go to bed ourselves after the inevitable preparations the smoking of the little pipe and the tap 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 on the edge of the box suddenly eve begins to move restlessly in his sleep to toss about giving great kicks on the wall and making a frightful noise what can be the matter i imagine at once that he must be dreaming of the old hag and her wolfish shadow chrysanthem raises herself on her elbow and listens with astonishment depicted on her face ah happy thought she has guessed what is tormenting him ka mosquitoes she says and to impress more forcibly her meaning on my mind she pinches my arm so hard with her little pointed nails at the same time imitating with such an amusing play of her features the grimace of a person who is stung that i exclaim oh stop chrysanthem this pantomime is too expressive and indeed useless i know the word car and had quite understood i assure you it is done so drolly and so quickly with such a pretty part that in truth i cannot think of being angry although i shall certainly have to-morrow a blue mark on my arm about that there is no doubt come we must get up and go to eve's rescue he must not be allowed to go on thumping in that manner let us take a lantern and see what has happened it was indeed the mosquitoes they are hovering in a thick cloud about him those of the house and those of the garden all seem collected together swarming and buzzing chrysanthem indignantly burns several at the flame of her lantern and shows me others who covering the white paper walls he tired out with his day's amusement sleeps on but his slumbers are restless as may be easily imagined chrysanthem gives him a shake wishing him to get up and share our blue mosquito net after a little pressing he does as he is bid and follows us looking like an overgrown boy only half awake i make no objection to this singular hospitality after all it looks so little like a bed the matting we are to share and we sleep in our clothes as we always do according to the nipponese fashion after all on a journey in a railway do not the most estimable ladies stretch themselves without demur by the side of gentlemen unknown to them i have however placed chrysanthem's little wooden block in the centre of the gauze tent between our two pillows without saying a word in a dignified manner as if she were rectifying an error of etiquette that i had inadvertently committed chrysanthem takes up her piece of wood putting in its place my snakeskin drum i shall therefore be in the middle between the two it is really more correct decidedly more proper 
chrysanthem is evidently a very decorous young person returning on board next morning in the clear morning sun we walk through pathways full of dew accompanied by a band of funny little mousmes of six or eight years of age who are going to school needless to say the cicalas around us keep up their perpetual sonorous chirping the mountain smells delicious the atmosphere the dawning day the infantine grace of these little girls in their long frocks and shiny coiffures all is redundant with freshness and youth the flowers and grasses on which we tread sparkle with dewdrops exhaling a perfume of freshness what undying beauty there is even in japan in the fresh morning hours in the country and the dawning hours of life besides i am quite ready to admit the attractiveness of the little japanese children some of them are most fascinating but how is it that their charm vanishes so rapidly and is so quickly replaced by the elderly grimace the smiling ugliness the monkeyish face chapter thirty five through a microscope the small garden of my mother-in-law madame renoncule is without exception one of the most melancholy spots i have seen in all my travels through the world oh the slow enervating dull hours spent in idle and diffuse conversation on the dimly lighted veranda oh the detestable peppered jam in the tiny pots in the middle of the town enclosed by four walls is this park of five yards square with little lakes little mountains and little rocks where all wears an antiquated appearance and everything is covered with a greenish mould from want of sunlight nevertheless a true feeling for nature has inspired this tiny representation of a wild spot the rocks are well placed the dwarf cedars no taller than cabbages stretch their gnarled boughs over the valleys in the attitude of giants wearied by the weight of centuries and their look of full-grown trees perplexes one and falsifies the perspective when from the dark recesses of the apartment one perceives at a certain distance this diminutive landscape dimly lighted the wonder is whether it is all artificial or whether one is not one's self the victim of some morbid illusion and whether it is not indeed a real country view seen through a distorted vision out of focus or through the wrong end of a telescope to any one familiar with japanese life my mother-in-law's house in itself reveals a refined nature complete bareness two or three screens placed here and there a teapot a vase full of lotus flowers and nothing more woodwork devoid of paint or varnish but carved in most elaborate and capricious openwork the whiteness of the pine wood being preserved by constant scrubbing with soap and water the posts and beams of the framework are varied by the most fanciful taste some are cut in precise geometrical forms others are artificially twisted imitating trunks of old trees covered with tropical creepers everywhere are little hiding places little nooks little closets concealed in the most ingenious and unexpected manner under the immaculate uniformity of the white paper panels i can not help smiling when i think of some of the so-called japanese drawing-rooms of our parisian fine ladies overcrowded with knick-knacks and curios and hung with coarse gold embroideries on exported satins i would advise those persons to come and look at the houses of people of taste out here to visit the white solitudes of the palaces at yeddo in france we have works of art in order to enjoy them here they possess them merely to ticket them and lock them up carefully in a kind of mysterious underground room called a godoun shut in by iron gratings on rare occasions only to honour some visitor of distinction do they open this impenetrable depository the true japanese manner of understanding luxury consists in a scrupulous and indeed almost excessive cleanliness white mats and white woodwork an appearance of extreme simplicity and an incredible nicety in the most infinitesimal details my mother-in-law seems to be really a very good woman and were it not for the insurmountable feeling of spleen the sight of her garden produces on me i should often go to see her she has nothing in common with the mamas of jonquille compagnule or touki she is vastly their superior and then i can see that she has been very good-looking and fashionable her past life puzzles me but in my position as a son-in-law good manners prevent my making further inquiries some assert that she was formerly a celebrated geisha in yeddo who lost public favour by her folly in becoming a mother this would account for her daughter's talent on the guitar 
she had probably herself taught her the touch and style of the conservatory since the birth of chrysantheme her eldest child and first cause of this loss of favour my mother-in-law an expansive although distinguished nature has fallen seven times into the same fatal error and i have two little sisters-in-law mademoiselle la neige or yuki-san and mademoiselle la lune tsuki-san as well as five little brothers-in-law cerisier pigeon liseron or and bambou little bambou is four years old a yellow baby fat and round all over with fine bright eyes coaxing and jolly sleeping whenever he is not laughing of all my nipponese family bambou is the one i love the most chapter thirty six my naughty doll tuesday august twenty seventh during this whole day we yves chrysantheme oyuki and myself have spent the time wandering through dark and dusty nooks dragged hither and thither by four quick-footed djinns in search of antiquities in the bric-a-brac shops towards sunset chrysantheme who has wearied me more than ever since morning and who doubtless has perceived it pulls a very long face declares herself ill and begs leave to spend the night with her mother madame renoncule i agree to this with the best grace in the world let her go tiresome little musme or yuki will carry a message to her parents who will shut up our rooms we shall spend the evening eve and i in roaming about as fancy takes us without any mousme dragging at our heels and shall afterward regain our own quarters on board the triomphant without having the trouble of climbing up that hill first of all we make an attempt to dine together in some fashionable tea-house impossible not a place is to be had all the absurd paper rooms all the compartments contrived by so many ingenious tricks of slipping and sliding panels all the nooks and corners in the little gardens are filled with japanese men and women eating impossible and incredible little dishes numberless young dandies are dining tete-a-tete -tete with the ladies of their choice and sounds of dancing girls and music issue from the private rooms the fact is to-day is the third and last day of the great pilgrimage to the temple of the jumping tortoise of which we saw the beginning yesterday and all nagasaki is at this time given over to amusement at the tea-house of the indescribable butterflies which is also full to overflowing but where we are well known they have had the bright idea of throwing a temporary flooring over the little lake the pond where the goldfish live and our meal is served here in the pleasant freshness of the fountain which continues its murmur under our feet after dinner we follow the faithful and ascend again to the temple up there we find the same elfin revelry the same masks the same music we seat ourselves as before under a gauze tent and sip odd little drinks tasting of flowers but this evening we are alone and the absence of the band of musmes whose familiar little faces formed a bond of union between this holiday-making people and ourselves separates and isolates us more than usual from the profusion of oddities in the midst of which we seem to be lost beneath us lies always the immense blue background nagasaki illumined by moonlight and the expanse of silvered glittering water which seems like a vaporous vision suspended in mid-air behind us is the great open temple where the bonzes officiate to the accompaniment of sacred bells and wooden clappers looking from where we sit more like puppets than anything else some squatting in rows like peaceful mummies others executing rhythmical marches before the golden background where stand the gods we do not laugh to-night and speak but little more forcibly struck by the scene than we were on the first night we only look on trying to understand suddenly eve turning round says hallo brother there is your mousme actually there she is behind him chrysantheme almost on all fours hidden between the paws of a great granite beast half tiger half dog against which our fragile tent is leaning she pulled my trousers with her nails for all the world like a little cat said eve still full of surprise positively like a cat she remains bent double in the most humble form of salutation she smiles timidly afraid of being ill-received and the head of my little brother-in-law bambou appears smiling too just above her own she has brought this little musco 
musco is the masculine of musme and signifies little boy excessive politeness makes it musco son mr little boy with her perched astride her back he looks as absurd as ever with his shaven head his long frock and the great bows of his silken sash there they stand gazing at us anxious to know how their joke will be taken for my part i have not the least idea of giving them a cold reception on the contrary the meeting amuses me it even strikes me that it is rather pretty of chrysanthem to come around in this way and to bring bambou san to the festival though it savours somewhat of her low breeding to tell the truth to carry him on her back as the poorer japanese women carry their little ones however let her sit down between eve and myself and let them bring her those iced beans she loves so much and we will take the jolly little musco on our knees and cram him with sugar and sweetmeats to his heart's content when the evening is over and we begin to think of leaving and of going down again chrysanthem replaces her little bambou astride her back and sets forth bending forward under his weight and painfully dragging her cinderella slippers over the granite steps and flagstones yes decidedly low this conduct but low in the best sense of the word nothing in it displeases me i even consider chrysanthem's affection for bambou san engaging and attractive in its simplicity one cannot deny this merit to the japanese a great love for little children and a talent for amusing them for making them laugh inventing comical toys for them making the morning of their life happy for a specialty in dressing them arranging their heads and giving to the whole personage the most fascinating appearance possible it is the only thing i really like about this country the babies and the manner in which they are understood on our way we meet our married friends of the triomphante who much surprised at seeing me with this musco jokingly exclaim what a son already down in the town we make a point of bidding good-bye to chrysanthem at the turning of the street where her mother lives she smiles undecided declares herself well again and begs to return to our house on the heights this did not precisely enter into my plans i confess however it would look very ungracious to refuse so be it but we must carry the musco home to his mamma and then begin by the flickering light of a new lantern bought from madame très propre our weary homeward ascent here however we find ourselves in another predicament this ridiculous little bambou insists on coming with us no he will take no denial we must take him with us this is out of all reason quite impossible however it will not do to make him cry on the night of a great festival too poor little musco so we must send a message to madame renoncule that she may not be uneasy about him and as there will soon not be a living creature on the footpaths of jujenji to laugh at us we will take it in turn eve and i to carry him on our backs all the way up that climb in the darkness and here am i who did not wish to return this way tonight dragging a mousme by the hand and actually carrying an extra burden in the shape of a musco on my back what an irony of fate as i had expected all our shutters and doors are closed bolted and barred no one expects us and we have to make a prodigious noise at the door chrysanthem sets to work and calls with all her might who ume san an 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 in english hi madame prune these intonations in her little voice are unknown to me her long-drawn call in the echoing darkness of midnight has so strange an accent something so unexpected and wild that it impresses me with a dismal feeling of far-off exile at last madame prune appears to open the door to us only half awake and much astonished by way of a nightcap she wears a monstrous cotton turban on the blue ground of which a few white stalks are playfully disporting themselves holding in the tips of her fingers with an affectation of graceful fright the long stalk of her beflowered lantern she gazes intently into our faces one after another to reassure herself of our identity but the poor old lady cannot get over her surprise at the sight of the musco i am carrying end of section five